Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Equipe Chuck History of Quebec and Canada training session. We are very, very happy to see you all here this afternoon. Uh, the turnout is uh, excellent. We were very happy to see how many of you replied. If there are any new attendees than the ones we were expecting, you are also welcome and we're happy to see you as well. My name is Julie Robitaille. I am in charge of uh, the languages and the social sciences at L'Equipe Choc Pedagogical. And I'm Vanessa Boilly, a pedagogical consultant too for the Equipe Choc Pedagogical First Nations and Inuit. Another thing that we wanted to mention is that it was very important that the English and the First Nations and Inuit communities get access to the presentation. So Vanessa and I were mandated a few, a few weeks ago to adapt the presentation for both communities. By doing so, we will ensure that the content be the same as the one presented by the ministry on October 29th. We, however, do not represent the ministry nor speak on behalf of the ministry, but rather in our capacity as L'Equipe Shop which is to support our networks in the implementation of this new program. We are going to open with the table of content and then the microphone will be Vanessa's for the first section. Uh, I forgot to mention that we have broken it down so that there's less going back and forth in Ma um, Vanessa's going to do her part, and then I will jump in and do my part, and we will conclude together and help with the translation at the end. So as you can see, part one will be regarding the program of study. Part two will be about the evaluation of learning. Part three is a special tool that we're going to leave you, which is la phrase histoire. And part four will be the Ministry of Education question period. So without further ado, uh, Vanessa is going to be starting right before you begin, though. Yes, uh, there's a question about the presentation being available. It will be put into a PDF version, and within the next two weeks or so, it should be ready, and we will send it to all the participants. Well, thank you, Julie. Uh, my part is actually to make sure that everyone has the same understanding of the history of Quebec and Canada program of study. I know many of you have already looked at the program, but I just wanna make sure that we start on the same basis today in order for Julie to explain us more in depth uh, evaluation later on. The program has many objectives. One of them is it wants to be a national history program that promotes the linking of political and social history in the Canadian, North American and world context. It also presents an inclusive framework that illustrates the diversity of the Quebec society. Of course, it's based on a competency-based approach, like all of the renewal programs that we know of. And it's also based on a chronological order. It's not on the slide, but I wanna to talk to you about the three main aims of the program. One is to acquire knowledge, the second one is to develop intellectual operations or intellectual skills. And the third one is to develop critical thinking and discussion skills in order to make our students better citizens. If we look here at an extract of the program, we have our two competencies. So all of the courses have the same competencies. We have the first one, which is to characterize, and the second one, which is to interpret. All of the course all are built the same way. They're using the same competencies. So once you get these two down, you're good for the rest of the courses of history. So that's good to know. So these two are closely related and are of equal importance. So one doesn't overcome the other. They work in interaction. When adult learners characterize a period in the history of Quebec and Canada, they also establish a framework for interpretation. And when interpreting a social phenomenon, the use of the historical method and support the, uh, actually support the interpretation by references to distinctive features. So one 
brings us to the other, that brings us to the other, and actually builds competency. We have a definition of the competency at the bottom of the slide, but I know that many of you guys already know what's the competency, but it's basically being able to mobilize or use a lot of resources at the same time. Let's address the first competency. It's actually to characterize a period, which is important, in the history of Quebec and Canada. But what does it really mean to characterize? It's actually to identify the distinctive features of a period, making connections among them and also describing them. And on the other hand, it's also to establish how things came to happen using sources. So we're still looking at the first one here. And we still ask ourselves, so what does the learner characterize exactly in this course? So what does really mean this competency? The focus is on time periods. All of the course all are actually built using time periods. Each course has two time periods. Uh, so from the origins to our time, we have eight time periods. Oh, yes. I wanted to say that the highlighted portion here from 1791 to 1840 uh, is actually highlighted for a reason. We're going to use it later on for, for our example. So if you want to look, have a quick look at the period and the social phenomenon associated to it, we're going to look at it later on. And now we're doing like a quick overview of the competencies but we're going to go back to the core structures and the details of the course compared to the YALT sector, just to know that this table is going to come back many times with different questions on it. So in the program study, a time period is constructed because it can be debated and it may vary depending on the topic. We have chosen eight time periods and they are defined by turning points. Let's say, for example, the first or the second industrial revolutions. And then it's also intended to facilitate the comprehension of the history of Quebec and Canada. This is another extract from the program. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I hope so. This is like one of the best graphs in the program, according to me, because we have the key features of the competency. And also we have the manifestations of these key features. So if we wanna know if our students are, is competent and is able to characterize, we have to make sure that all of the actions stated are actually happening. So let's say that if my, my student wants to characterize, he has to establish historical facts, establish a chronology, consider ge geographical features, and then we can look at manifestation of each, each key feature. Let's say to establish a chronology, we need to refer to chronological reference points. Uh, sorry, refer to, that was hard for me. <laughs> to refer to chronological reference points and also establish the sequence of events. So it's always to see, is my student competent in that competency? That's why we highlighted the circle. So it's like, I look at these actions, these manifestations, and if they are in place, if my student is able to do them, it means he is competent and he's able to characterize. We're gonna look closer at an example and it's taken from the program too. So I'm gonna read this one aloud. For example, the characterization of the period from 1791 to 1840 will require the adult to link together several pieces of information related to different aspects of society, to describe distinctive features of the historical period in question, I'm not going to repeat it, from a cultural, social, political, economic, and territorial perspective. What does it mean? Like, if I say this, I receive this question, and I want to see if my student is able to characterize this. It means that thus, he could describe the territory recognized by the Constitutional Act of 1791, it could also describe a sequence of its political events and also the chronology of economical events. So these are aspects that I could see my students do. This is an example. So looking at the second competency, it's actually to interpret a social phenomenon. Once again, we ask ourselves, what does it mean to interpret? 
It's actually to assign meaning to social reality and explaining it. That's okay. And also establishing why things came to happen. Once again, using sources. This is going to come back many times and you're going to see in Julie's presentation, sources is the core of how we actually uh, analyze how our students are, well, are able to mobilize the competency or not. The same table or chart as before. I'm going to let you a second to look at it and then I'm going to bring your attention on something specific. So the first competency was linked to time periods characterize time periods. The second competency is linked to social phenomena. So here, if we want to know if our student is able to interpret, we have to make sure that the focus is on social phenomena. For each of the time periods, we have a social phenomenon associated with it. Once again, we're going to look at our example, which is from 1791 to, to so sorry, to 1840, the demands and struggles of nationhoods. We will use an example later on with the same time period. Now looking at the social phenomenon. But before we go there, it's important to all have the same vision of what's the social phenomenon. So by definition, it's the human action in a given social historical context. It is also situated in time. The choice of social phenomenon is based on the importance of the transformation it evokes in terms of the Quebec societies. And also its interpretation is intended to facilitate the critical analysis of the past. Well, and it's also a team in itself. So it helps build courses. Once you want to build your courses, you have to build it using the time periods and the phenomenon that takes place during these time periods. So that's why we call it a team. Same graph as before, another diagram. This one is for the second competency. So to interpret the social phenomenon. Each competent, oh, each competency is presented the same way and they don't change from course to course. It's always the same key features and the same manifestations. Only the content of the course change, changes, sorry. So if I want to know if I'm able to interpret, I could define the object of interpretation, of course, analyze the social phenomenon, very important, and make sure of the validity of my interpretation. So these are the key features and each of them have manifestations. Manifestation will help us determine, determine sorry, uh, if our student is competent. Once again. So let's look at the second example. It's from the same time period. I'm going to leave you like, let you maybe a minute to read it, and then I'm going to read it with you guys because I want you to see what's the difference. So the, at the first time the focus was on the time period, look how it's different now, even though it's the same time period. So I'm gonna go on, I hope you had the time to read. So you can see that the focus on the first example was really on the time period and the ability of the students to characterize, to describe. Here, we want the students to interpret so for example, the interpretation of the social phenomenon, the demands and struggles of nationhood will lead the adult to explain how the demands and struggles of nationhood contributed to the colony's quest for political autonomy during the historical period in place 1791-1840. But what does it really mean? What does the students? Well, actually the students could explain the consequences of Napoleon's blockade on the British colony or the cultural changes in Lower Canada, or the social changes regarding immigration and population growth, or even continuities. Sometimes changes can be, it remains the same. There is no change. So this is an example of the second competency to interpret. I said at the beginning that we would go back to the, like we just looked at the 
program structure. Now we're going to look at a course structure more in detail, but we're also going to look at it from a, a more um, general point of view. So here we have all of the courses. I have highlighted the course numbers in different colors for a reason. So the program of study is divided into four courses that we've shown. There are the same course that we're showing since the beginning of the presentation. And they are based on a chronological order, like we said, from the origins to our time. But what's interesting here, if we compare our reality in adult education to the youth sector, is actually that the first two courses, so the HSG 4101 and 4102, are equivalent to the secondary three history courses. So these are the same from the youth sector. So if a student actually did them in the yacht sector, in secondary three and passed them, of course, they can be recognized in the other sector. The second part is specific to adult education. So the HSP courses are only for the adult ed sector. And these two, that's why they have a different code to really like see the difference between the two. And if they were in, if a student want to do the, wants to do the last two courses, they have to have done the first two, either in the youth sector or the adult sector. So they are like a pre prerequisite. I'm, I'm looking for the word in my hand, but you have to do the first two in order to be able to do the last two, either in our adult ed sector or the youth sector. Also, you have to notice that each course has two credits, which means that they are each 50 hours. So that's not a surprise here if you're used to our adult education codes. And also I wanted to mention that in order to get a high school degree, a student has to get optional credits from secondary four and five. They actually need eight and eight of those need to be in social sciences. It doesn't have to be a history course. So it means that students could do history courses, but they could choose another course from, well, at least two other courses from social sciences like financial education. So this is like a, this was, a, this information was given in a full fax from the past. But if you want uh, to have the specific number, I have them uh, in an email already because I received questions beforehand about this. So I was very prepared. <laughs> if you, have a, you want the number of the info function, I could give you the numbers and you can look with your centers uh, and get the information. So I'm going to go on. If I have no question on this part, I know that it's like a more, Puts in part. No, it's okay. <laughs> uh, the only thing, Vanessa, that may yeah. be something that we wish to uh, to tell everybody, whenever you have a uh, a table or whenever we illustrate the competencies and the key features, all of those are taken directly from the uh, program of study. So the documents we did not make them; we just took them and from the from the uh, the program, just in case questions arise with that in mind. Perfect, thank you, Julie. Yeah, and I was lucky. All of the, the things in my uh, part are pretty clear. You're gonna see Julie, sometimes it's not as easy to take uh, pictures or, <laughs> and put it on screen. So these are, and actually this one, Julie was very kind and she redid it because we couldn't like get a clear view of this one. So some of them, they're from the program like this one, but we did just put it differently in the PowerPoint to be sure that everybody could see all there is to see. Thanks. Yeah, that's a very important question. And thank so you. So, if sure. anything, if you see any typos in uh, documents that are our colors, which is uh, then that would be my fault, and I do apologize uh, beforehand. You're very nice. Well, you can put it on my uh, on me too. We're both uh, responsible, but thank you. <laughs> so now we're going to really look at the course structure and what's inside one course. So of course, there's subject specific content that is composed of the following elements. So we already saw periods in the history of Quebec and Canada, social phenomena, that, that, that's what we just saw. There's also historical knowledge, of course, concepts, 
but there's also two that are not subject specific, but rather they're integrated throughout the content. So throughout the first four, which are, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing my screen right now. I don't have, okay. <laughs> I wasn't saying the right thing. So cultural references and techniques. So these two, they are not subject specific, but we see them through the first four. Now, we have a table that's taken from the program again, but that we redid in order for you guys to be able to read it correctly. So thanks you, Julie, for that. So you're gonna see that for each course, and here we have the 4101, uh, there's different elements that are present. So you have the, pre, the periods and social phenomena. So that's what we just saw. We also have concepts. Some are common and some are specific. We're gonna look into this later on. And then we have the knowledge. It's very important to know that concepts and knowledge are what's used to actually characterize and interpret. So that's what we're gonna use while we're becoming more competent in each of the two competencies. So this is an example. If we look at the historical knowledge, there's different ways to present it. You will see if you look through the program already, the historical knowledge is presented in three different ways or forms. The first one is text form. Like we see at the top, we have a text and we have the knowledge. We also have timelines. And finally, we can have listings or a list of knowledge. For each of the historical knowledge, it's presented in the three different way above. So you will find this everywhere in the program, text, timeline, and list. Looking back at the concept, so when I presented the table two slides ago, I said there's some common one and there's some specific one. So the study of history leads to the, the development of prescribed concepts, we're not surprised, like alliance and trade. Those are specific. But in addition to these specific ones, there are other that are more common, which address, uh, we, we're sorry, which are addressed in all of the courses. So they can be used in different courses, uh, such as power and economy, not just in history courses, all of the science courses social science courses. So we see that we have very specific, specific one and we have general one. When it comes to cultural references, of course, history is a rich learning environment. So we have to use the cultural references in history classroom, of course. Also, the subject specific content is composed of cultural references that must be taken into account in lesson planning. But we have to know that they are not provided in the program. So it's really a teacher's responsibility to actually make sure of knowing and deciding and choosing uh, and select, selecting different cultural references they wanna make sure that their students have and get and understand. So this is an aspect that's very important. Systems that provided explicitly in the program, a list of them, you have to make this. Vanessa, before you move mm -hmm. on, if I may, uh, I have a question from a participant Go regarding ahead. the sanction that you were referring to when you were going over the grid a few slides yeah. ago. Um, the person missed whether each course is a prerequisite for the next one. Could you make sure to go okay. over the yeah. uh, slide? Sorry about going back, uh, everyone. <laughs> it's okay, it's here. To make sure yeah. this is the one right there. So can you just go over that yeah. one uh, one more time? Thank you. So in order to take H H sorry, HST 4103, which is a secondary for adult education course, the students need to have done either the first two HST G4101, HSG4102 before being able to take 4103. And they are in order because they're in a chronological order and they're supposed to be given in that order. But we have students that come from the youth sector that have already done the secondary three courses and these would be credited the first two, 
AF40, HSG, well, HSG4101 and HSG4102. So if these were done in the youth sector, youth sector, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm back again with my youth. Yeah, with the youth sector. So there's no problem. They can be credited and the students is able to do the last two in order 4103, then 4104. But if they are not done, it's not possible to take 4103, 4104. They can be done at the adult sector. So we can give the first two. I don't know if it's more clear. So the, yeah, we have to take all of them in order. And the first two are a prerequisite for the last two. But we have many students, like we, I remember in my center, we actually analyzed and a lot of students from the youth sector actually have done these courses. So that's very important when they arrive that we make sure that they were not done and actually uh, a success in the youth sector because then they don't need to take the first two and they already have four credits uh, in social sciences. I hope it's clearer, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to move on. But if it's not 100% clear, I want to say that I sent an email to someone about this recently, and I could really just share to the person if the person wants to write an email to me at the end. I have an email that I wrote with sanction, and it's like super clear exactly what needs to be done. Sorry, I'm just going back in time <laughs> in the presentation. So, we were up to the techniques. So we were really looking at the content of each course. And we said before that techniques are also part of the program. So the study of periods and social phenomena requires the use of techniques, both to obtain information and also to communicate research results. The techniques are not an object of studying themselves, but repeating them helps the agile learners become increasingly proficient or competent with them. So it's very important to know that it's the repetition of using these techniques that is super important in your classrooms. And the techniques are as follow. We have using and creating representations in time, of time, sorry, and using and creating historical maps. So what does it mean? In other words, apart from text, students can have timelines and maps to interpret. So these are the only ones they can have. They can have text, Timelines and maps to interpret. That's my fast overview of the program. Since I know that many of the people that are attending, I know I've already seen different presentations either in French or in the past regarding the program, but we wanted to be sure actually that all the participants were able to follow because it's a bit more complex what Julie's gonna present after about evaluation. So we wanted to make sure that we all have the same ground on this. Same understanding. We do have a few minutes. Uh, if yeah. you have specific questions to the program section that Vanessa just went uh, went over, you can put your hand up. We can take a few questions. We do have a few minutes. And if you don't have a specific questions and you put it in the chat, uh, we do uh, we try to provide answers as we go. Some of you may need us to meet and, you know, go over something more specific and it will be offered. Do not worry. So any questions? Uh, I, there's a question from Mr. Gray. Um, yes. When is this um, new program going to be implemented? Um, I work at Place Cartier Adult Education Center and I, there's been talk about this for the past oof, maybe 10 years. And so like, uh, it seems like every year it says, oh, it's gonna be next year. And then next year comes, oh, it's gonna be the next year. And so um, when will it be um, implemented? Well, I can take this one, Julie. It's just, I don't remember the specific date in August, 2000. I, th I think it's August 31st. The, the, code, the, the codes close on the 31st, so. Yeah, this, this is the, the latest news we have, of course. Uh, we are not, you know, the information might change, but we have to say that these sessions were given in accordance with the Ministry uh, of Education uh, from adult and sector. So I think they want everybody to be re ready for August. So I think we have a clear view that there's an intention for it to be closed in August 2022. Okay, 2022. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Uh, one last question, maybe before we move on, Mr. Gray. Um, yes. So, um, <clears throat> so they don't really need Canadian history to graduate. I understand that. But will that um, diploma in adult ed, will that allow them to get into CJEPI University if they don't have the Canadian history per se, instead yeah. of having the, the, so, the, the social, um, social credits instead? Honestly, this is a question that we need to bring to our sanction expert, because what she explained to me is that in order to get the high school diploma, but just the diploma, not whatever they wanted to do after it. You understand? Okay. So there might be other, uh, uh, some CJEPs might ask specific things, some courses, even uh, like vocational might ask for specific courses. And this okay. is not what we're addressing right okay. now. We're just saying okay. get a high school diploma. Yeah, it's well, it's because my understanding is if you don't take Canadian history, yes, you can get a diploma, a high school diploma. And that's the I've been teaching in adult ed now for 20 years. And that was the case. However, if you wanted to go into university or CJEP, you had to get the, the history credits, the Canadian history credits. So I'm just wondering if, if that has changed. Around, and then you'll have well, the other person tell me that that's why that we invite you to write that question down if yeah. you want in the chat so we can really address it. And okay. verify on our end with our section sanction okay. uh, representatives so that we do you. steer you in the right direction. Great. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Before we get into the evaluation of learning portion, uh, we wanted to go and do a little overview of how history has been taught in the last uh, hundred or hundreds of years and how it came to become what it is now and what is coming up in August. So as we know, history has been taught as a subject since the 17th century. Our grandparents, if we move a few years uh, past, our grandparents were taught that the history of the French Canadian uh, people. And our experience as uh, history students was more focused on the two main founding people. So it, had, it was moving on, if you will. It was very much objective at the time and there were more you know, it was boxed in. Huh? There were the two founding peoples and that's pretty much how this was addressed. Our children and our students in the last few years were introduced to the historical method, which was more engaged and more critical. And the goal was now to form a critical thinker and a well-informed citizen. With this new program that's coming up, um, we are moving towards a critical analysis and the development of abilities in order for learners to better address current issues, especially at the, at the adult education level. This evolution is of course reflected in the evaluation of learning. You will also notice that some of the slides in this part of the presentation are uh, very much text heavy. We do apologize for this. Uh, it was important that the content was really uh, presented to you as it was presented to us. And there may be a few slides that are a little text heavy. If you uh, wish for me to slow down, slow the pace down, please do not hesitate to type it into the chat section and Vanessa will let me know. So we're going to move into the evaluation of learning portion. And this is essentially what's newer or the newest part of the program. First off, we want to ask ourselves, and it's always, been, uh, uh, it's always been a concern, what is evaluation? What does that entail? Well, first off, evaluation is a teacher's professional judgment, and it is, for now, criteria-based to compare learning to the expectations of the program. In a nutshell, that's pretty much what we have to do when we evaluate. Now the question of what is being evaluated brings up the point of competencies and skills and knowledge. All of this is pretty much the learning that is evaluated. So by learning, we evaluate uh, through the development and exercise of competencies. We evaluate the development of a range of skills and know-hows, and we look at the acquisition of historical knowledge and how knowledge is constructed throughout. When we evaluate subject-specific competencies, you will notice that on the right-hand side, you have the two competencies that Vanessa has presented to you earlier, 
characterize a period and interpret a social phenomenon. Uh, and then you have on the left-hand side, evaluation criteria in, uh, we have three of them. The first one is coherent representation of a period in the history of Quebec and Canada. The second one is rigor of interpretation. And the third one is appropriate use of knowledge, which we put in a different color so that we bring attention to the fact that this one is assessed with seven intellectual operations. If we look at the first and second criteria, criteria, sorry, we can see that they are directly linked to a competency. So for example, to characterize a period, a student has to coherently represent a period in the history of Quebec and Canada. So we wish to evaluate that representation, that coherence, and then it leads us to understanding whether or not the student has developed enough of that competency to characterize. In the case of interpreting a social phenomenon, we look at the rigor of interpretation. So in this case, the criteria will be about how the student was able to make links, connections, put support around their statement, and then prove that with that rigor of interpretation that they were indeed competent in the uh, interpretation of a social phenomenon. The appropriate use of knowledge, however, is a little different in that there is no proper, you know, a, a, an evaluation of the knowledge per se, but rather how the knowledge is used. And in this case, the knowledge is used in both competencies. That's why you have the appropriate use of knowledge on the left and on the right, the two competencies in the same box. And again, we will look at it a little further down with the seven intellectual operations that are identified, that are attached or that go in accordance with the use of knowledge. So the first of our three evaluation criteria is coherent representation of a period in the history of Quebec and Canada. Uh, so this evaluation criterion allows for the evaluation of the student's ability to characterize. So as I showed you in the, pro in the previous slide, in the chart, the two were uh, on, the same, on the same level, side by side. So we wanna know if the student characterizes well, if he or she is able to characterize, and we use the coherent representation criterion for that purpose. In this little box right here, you have the exact uh, information taken directly from the DED, uh, for the new history program. The sample tasks that are at the core of this criterion can take the shape of five and even more specific tasks. This is taken directly from a document from the ministry, so it's copied and pasted. I hope it is clear on your end. It seems pretty clear on this side. So you have five that can be used and of course, current and future practices may add to the list of tasks. So you have diagrams, you have table, text, descriptive timeline, and periodization, which is uh, establishing a, a beginning and an end in a time frame. Now, the task that is currently performed during the end of course examinations is the diagram right here. So that's what we're going to use in our samples or examples for the next few slides. As you are already aware and familiar with, we have also document files that are, uh, that are used in our evaluation tasks. The tasks that are designed for the adult learner to demonstrate their level of development of competency one, which is to characterize, they do so from the use of set of resource. Now, in this case, you have two examples. You have a map and you have an, an image or an illustration. You can also use excerpts from uh, publications like magazines, newspapers, uh, excerpts from textbooks or websites. We can also see tables, even timelines. They can be of various types, okay? But the document files are really at the core of the evaluation because we want to make sure that students can use these, these document files to then put into their own words and 
explain or describe what they need to present to us as their competency level. So the roles of the document files in the first criterion, we're still in the first one, which is the coherent representation. Uh, as you can see in the boxes here, you have a few uh, keywords that we placed in, that we put in different color and in bold. So the role of documents in criterion one are to contribute to the production of a description. So we ask the student to describe. The documents can either guide the learner in determining the type of the description, the topic, sorry, of the description, or enable them to provide details about how they relate, how elements relate to the topic. So coherent representation, production of a description, determining the, the uh, topic or how the elements relate to that topic. Now, this disclaimer concerns the next few slides uh, because we could have just tell, told you four, three, four times uh, back to back, but we would rather give you a disclaimer for the entire section. So the next few slides from 34 to 49 have not been validated by a committee of teachers, but they are taken or adapted from a ministry publication that you have right there, okay? So there will be examples of questions. They are uh, from the document. They are uh, also um, coherent, but they were not, they were not, they didn't pass through the validation process. So a sample question in criteria one could look something like this. So it does comprise of three different elements. The first element would be a contextualization or a mise en context uh, of the question. So in this case, we see in the second half of the 19th century, Quebec experienced socioeconomic development facilitated by technological innovation and the availability of labor. So we're putting this into a context. We're giving the student an idea where we want him or her, uh, him or he or she, sorry, to go and describe. The question itself is in purple right there. So the formulation of the question, describe the period of economic and social transformation that took place in Quebec in the second half of the 19th century. Notice in the context for second half of the 19th century in the question, second half of the, uh, of the 19th century. Then the student is presented with a procedure on how to answer the question properly. So they will be asked to refer to documents one to 11 of the document file. Yes, it is a lot of documents, but you will see why. And they will select only the documents that are relevant to the topic that they must describe. In this case, we're going back to second half of the 19th century, economic and social transformation. They will then fill in the diagram with information from the selected documents. I will show you an example of what document files could look like in this particular context. So as you can see, the 11 document files that were referred to in the previous slides are indeed there in the document file section. One thing you should know, and this is sounds like a technicality, but it is a very important thing to look into, is that your exam should be presented and any type of document should be presented in booklet format so that we can allow for a double page spread when it comes to document files such as these. And this allows for students to uh, have easier reference and also easier annotation as they go. Because we do hope and encourage that they will write something down, they will look into, uh, look into each of the files. Now they do have to consider all 11 of them so that they can then discriminate and decide which ones to select that will be useful or relevant to the question, which I remind you again, deals with the second half of the 19th century and the economic, the changes or the transformations that were relevant to that time period. 
which means that although it is not specifically prescribed and in number, for example, students will eliminate some of those, okay? And if they do it correctly, they should have eliminated or they should be eliminating four of them. Sorry about the arrow going up and down. They should be eliminating four of them, which will mean that they, leave, they keep seven to look into and prepare uh, to fill in the diagram that is going to be presented to them. Again, the reminder here about examinations being printed in booklet form and the double page spread being used for resources such as these is reminded to you. And as you can see, the documents stamped X are not relevant. They may be simply out in, in terms of date. Uh, they could be referring to a, let's say an earlier date than the second half of the 19th century. They could be referring to uh, a change that is not relevant to the time period. And that's what students should be able to discriminate and eliminate so that they do not get confused uh, in the preparation of their answer. So notice here, there are seven left, but this is not a prescribed number, okay? Nor is four the prescribed number of elements to uh, eliminate or take away. Having done this discrimination and having selected the, the sources that they will need, they will be presented with something like this, for example, which is a sample question, but now we're looking at how to put it into writing, okay? So this, depending on the size, can also be done on a double page spread or on a single page, depending on the room that it takes in the booklet itself. Notice that you will see three different colored boxes. This is not something that would be in the exam booklet, but it is for the, the, uh, the purpose of the presentation because we will see the evaluation rubric for criterion number one later in a few slides. So this would allow for a little bit easier reference. So you'll have the pink, the yellow or orange and the uh, turquoise aqua boxes and you'll see why in a minute. So the question will be then reformulated again to make sure that everything is clear, that students have access to the question once again. And then the question describe the period of economic and social transformation that took place in Quebec in the second half of the 19th century. They can always refer to their notes and what they have annotated in the document file because it's in the booklet and available, readily available to them. So the task is to complete the diagram. The topic of the description, so they will have to name the period of major economic and social change. They would write it in this box of the diagram. And then for this topic, they would have to uh, identify two central elements, which are placed here in two different boxes or bubbles, if you will. Inside for each central element, they would have in this case to identify the main source of energy used and then a developing industrial sector and a growing mode of transportation for this particular element. Then they move on to the other central element which is a place where the work was done. And then they complete with people who worked at this place and an example of working condition. All of this information is to be found in the document file that are available to them and that they have hopefully worked and annotated on. So remember the three colors, they will be useful. And here are the colors. Uh, so you have in front of you a, uh, the rubric, the rubric that is in the ministry documents for the criterion coherent representation of uh, a period. Now, as you can see here, it is based on observable elements. So we have to have in front of us the information and it has to be clearly and readily observable. And as I showed you earlier, I, we have circled or we have uh, boxed in with the same color as is found in the actual 
page here, although they're not in the document itself, this is simply for presentation purpose. And in the rubric, we have also used the same color. So for example, the first part of the rubric, which is going to give the student a maximum of two points is for the indication of the topic of the, the, uh, the description. So if the topic of description is well identified in their other page right here, then you are good to go and you can go ahead and give them their two marks. If the student indicates the topic to some extent, then you have professional judgment that you can use, of course, and see to which extent this uh, is a correct answer or not, or how correct or how much it is. And if they indicate the topic incorrectly or do not indicate it, of course, this is a zero mark. The second part of the rubric is pretty much the same. Actually, it is the same for both colors on the other page in that you must assess whether the student has identified the central elements properly and to which extent. So the rubric is built this way so that you can see if they did provide details or not and how much so you can take a look at the marks that are allotted for the combination of having provided enough or not enough details. And you do this twice, which means that for each of the boxes that they have in, your, in their diagram, you can take a look and really observe whether or not they've given you enough information to show their uh, understanding and the, the competence in this particular representation. So now that we have done criterion number one, that had to do with characterization. We're now gonna look into the second criterion. This one has to do with the rigor of the interpretation and is directly linked with competency two, which is interpreting a social phenomenon. So the evaluation criterion, rigor of interpretation, is allowing for the evaluation of the student's ability to interpret the social phenomenon. Uh, as Vanessa showed you earlier, where you have the chart and you have the periods and the, uh, the social phenomenon that are attached to each, well, that's what we expect students to be competent with. Again, here from the DED, the text from the ministry document, I added it, sorry. I added it so that you could refer to the actual wording of the ministry document. with criteria number one, there are a few sample tasks that can be used to evaluate the uh, rigor of interpretation. Notice that the rigor of interpret interpretation, sorry, may be in the form of a longer answer. That is the case for our sample question, but it can also take the form of a diagram or a discussion between uh, classmates uh, in the form of an oral evaluation, for example, or maybe just as you go through a, a, an LES in class, for example, and you wanna go and see how they can interact and explain uh, to each other, that could be one way of doing it. The task that is currently performed during the end of course examination is the text form. But you can also use diagram discussion or anything that is going to be uh, current or future practice added to the list. So again, we're going to look at a sample document file. They look different in that I just wanted to make sure that we could see different types of uh, document files. This one is an excerpt from a Canadian, the Canadian Encyclopedia, and we have a, a picture, but it could be a timeline, it could be a map, it could be another type of excerpt. Uh, it could be the picture of a person, uh, an important person, an agent of uh, a specific agent that we want to look into. And the tasks that are designed for this competency are always using the document files as their source because we want to see how they're gonna use the resources to interpret the social phenomenon and then put it into uh, a clear uh, and uh, sometimes concise, other times developed uh, fashion. 
So the role of the documents file, the document file, sorry, in the rigor of interpretation criterion are in this case to uh, contribute to the production of an interpretation, an explanation, okay, of the social phenomenon. When we had characterized on one end, now we're interpreting, uh, we're interpreting the social phenomenon. So the documents will guide the learner in determining the topic of the description, or they will enable uh, the learner to illustrate or explain the elements in light of the instructions that are provided in the question. So this is important because if, you're, if, if you want, for example, to see it in a diagram, then of course you're going to put the instructions so that students fill a diagram. And so they will illustrate or explain in light of the type of task that you want them to do. As we said, in this particular example, we opted for the text description. So in this case, and again, there's color, but there will not be color anywhere in the actual document. This is for the sake of the presentation. If you look, it looks a little bit like the other criterion, the way that the question is presented looks somewhat familiar, somewhat similar to it, except that there's an element of a visual element that was added to it. So you still have the contextualization right here that gives the student an idea where they're going to have to set, uh, set the situation, where they have to go in their knowledge of what they learned and what they're going to have to explain. In this case, we want to go back to the first half of the 19th century and the, uh, the context is driven by the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain. The economy of Lower Canada underwent major transformations particularly in the lumber and wheat industry. So contextualization is done, but it's also presented in an, a visual form, okay? So there normally would be probably arrows between here. This may have been a, 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 an omission on my part, but nonetheless, the economic change that is what we really want the student to interpret. We also have the two elements that show that they have to explain the lumber industry, the change in the lumber industry and the one in the wheat industry. And you have the actual question, okay? So explain the economic changes that occurred in Lower Canada between 1791 and 1840. In this case, you would have in your paper or in your essay, in your text, you must. And then there are two requirements. So we want to see how they can identify the economic change in the lumber industry and explain why it occurred. And then secondly, if they can identify an economic change in the wheat industry and explain why it occurred. Again, the colors will not show in the document, but we have used highlighting to uh, to identify the same, we, we use them as identification so that you could see in the rubric which is which, just like we did earlier. They also will be given a procedure. The procedure are basically the requirements of the actual explanation or the actual uh, representation of their understanding of the competency. In this case, it is a paper or an essay of approximately 150 words. They will be given a diagram to structure their essay, and they will have to refer to six documents in the document file. Notice that in this case, there are less, but they also do not select. All six of them will be useful and they are all relevant to the task. So no discrimination in this case, because that would be uh, an operation that would be extra and then students would probably have a hard time explaining if they could not uh, use all of the text. So we leave the document files discrimination for the characterization and we use all of them for uh, the interpretation. So you would have a sample document file that looks something like this. Again, this would be two pages. That would be, again, on a you know, two-page spread. 
in a booklet format, the same way that we presented the rest. And students would be able to annotate, highlight, and so on. But in this case, they do not need to discriminate and remove anything. All the documents in this section refer to the social phenomenon that we want them to uh, explain. So all of them will contribute to the development of the explanation itself. I guess so far so good. Now we will have something, it, of course the diagram could look different. Um, this is simply a form of diagram that could, that, that could be used. Um, graphic organizers can change in the process of your teaching, uh, but then uh, the ministry will have their own representation, of course, but it would look something like this. Definitely would be, uh, you know, including the information that, that is in there. This could also be on a double page spread, depending on the room that we want to leave, leave students or the length of the text that we wish for them to produce. In this case, with 150 words, per, I would say that this should be a, a two page spread. Now, on the left hand side, you have the diagram, the change in lumber industry and the reason for the change, the change in the wheat industry and the reason for the change. Note that the rough draft or outline of ideas is not evaluated as is or in isolation. The students may use, and we do encourage them to use this, uh, this part, the diagram as a rough or an outline of their notes to make sure they don't forget anything. But the actual final version in text form is the one that we're going to be evaluating, okay? So that is very important. I hope it doesn't happen, but a student leaving this completely, whoop, sorry, leaving this side completely blank and having a somewhat, you know, good explanation on the other side, well, that's what we are evaluating. Of course, we encourage students to use the diagram and to use the, uh, the, rough, uh, the rough draft areas to form their ideas, to write notes, to, and I also, I always told my students, abuse this part, because this is where you make sense of what you wanna say. And then the other side would be the final version in text form, and that's the one that we evaluate. Notice that the question is also, again, repeated, stated at the top of the question page, of course, as it is with every other section. Now the evaluation rubric on the rigor of interpretation is pretty much done the same way or put together the same way that the first one was. It is based on observable elements. And as you can see, you have the first and the second element of the answer on the left-hand side as the, uh, the, uh, the descriptor or what you want to observe. And then you have the two columns in one, you need to indicate the element of the answer and the second one, sorry, you need to support the elements. So as you notice, there was highlighting in my, uh, in my question page. And this is before we wanted to make sure to illustrate that the first item of the question, which was the lumber industry and why it underwent such a change is what we evaluate here. Again, presence of the element of answer correctly to some extent or not, and then how supported it was. And we repeat this operation with the second portion of the answer, all of which add up to an, a total of eight points. Again, this would be an eight point question. We will make sure that the PDF does have the colored, uh, the colored boxes, just in case this could be helpful. Okay, we're gonna leave it in uh, for, uh, for clarity purposes. Still no questions, Vanessa? Good. No question in the chat. I don't know if people wanna write up questions right now, if you have any. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we're good. Oh, yes, Mr. Gray has one. Yes, Mr. Gray. Yes, and the, um, see, my students, um, French, nor, neither French nor English, for a lot mm -hmm. of them are their first languages. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so they would have problems expressing themselves. However, in the graphic organizer, which I really like, if they put the, the right answers in the graphic um, organizers, but they fail to express themselves, you know, intelligibly in, in a, in a 150 word essay, um, I would, I would be um, leaning on the side of, well, they understood the question and they answered it. But according to this, um, they would get a failing mark. Yes, I understand uh, where you're coming from. And I do, I, I do hear you on that. Uh, however, the requirements do call for the evaluation of the final version in text form. If you wish to address this at the end in the, in the period, uh, the, 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 the question period with um, Madame Giroir or Mr. Mayotte, uh, maybe they can uh, they can uh, enlighten you a little bit more or explain more in detail uh, where this is coming from. Okay, great. And one more question. Yes. Um, I really like uh, the documents, um, images, um, tables, and all these. Um, we don't in adult ed. We don't have textbooks, which mm-hmm. I find crazy. Um, where would I get access to these tables and these maps and these diagrams? Um, I've gone on to Google. Um, however, I never find anything that's really okay. This really fits what what I'm trying to teach right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so where where would I be able to find these things? Well, for one, um, and I'm sure this is the case for uh, for Vanessa's uh, for Vanessa, we do have a website where we try to upload uh, different learning situations, activities, uh, and uh, possible references or, or links to pages on the internet where you'd have maps and so on and so forth. So you could very well go and visit those websites if that is something that you are inclined towards and you may find a lot of information in there. Uh, otherwise you can always contact Vanessa if you are from the uh, FNI or me if you're from the Anglophone sector and we can help you along for sure. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. That. You're welcome. I have a question from Emily too. Yes. Hi. Um, to further add to that, uh, William, I stuck a link in the chat for you. That is the uh, Communité Histoire du Québec et du Canada mm-hmm. um, that was created, um, I think, by the ministry. Anyway, Paul Rumbo from Learn. <laughs> has uh, learned Quebec, he has added a whole bunch of document packages um, and they are available through that site. So if you sign up for that, um, you'll be able to find all those packages that he's prepared. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. That's an excellent resource, by the way, yes. Any more questions? Okay, let me just find my way back. So we are, past our evaluation rubric. And now we're going to look at the third criterion. This one will be, um, we will need to maybe go over a few things. Uh, It may be a bit more text heavy or there may be lots of explanation. I hope you can still bear with me. Uh, The appropriate use of knowledge is a criterion that is used for both competencies, both in the characterize and the interpret portion of what we want to make sure our students can do, okay, as learners. The reason why it is in both competencies is that knowledge in itself is not something that is evaluated and like in isolation, for example, but rather used several times and reinvested throughout the four courses or even prior to uh, secondary three and four history or through their learning or watching videos or being interested in history as some of our students are. Uh, So the knowledge is really um, the skills that have been acquired and constructed over time and that are used in both the characterization and the interpretation competencies. And that's where the seven intellectual operations Uh, That's where they fit. That's where we place them, because we can demonstrate our use of knowledge through those operations. So the evaluation criterion here allows for the assessment of the student's ability to apply knowledge through intellectual operations. 
and they apply knowledge in either or or both competencies, as the very early chart showed. And the text from the ministry, of course, you have there to uh, support this. So sample document files, again, uh, we chose two different ones here. So a picture or a chart, uh, a, um, a graph, okay? Those are not, uh, those are not uh, at English sources because they were, uh, they couldn't be found in English, but for the sake of having at least a visual representation of what they looked like, we thought they would be, uh, they would be uh, okay to use. They come from the presentation that we had uh, on October 29th. So they are taken directly from there. And in the third criteria on the tasks that are, are designed for the learner to demonstrate their level of development of competencies one and two. And we do so with the use of, again, a set of resources, a set of document files, which I can repeat the list, but any of what we have uh, seen and, 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 and uh, listed so far can be used. Now, in the third criterion, the document files take on more than one or two roles. They will take on four different roles, okay, because they, the, uh, the intellectual operations are more numerous in this case. So, for example, the role of documents may be to suggest ways of answering the questions, avenues that they can take to answer the questions, and how we do so is that in the source, in the document file, the student can develop the answer by indicating reference points in space and time. So there may be timelines or maps, for example. And in this case, the document may or may not be mentioned in the question. So when you are looking at, uh, you know, suggesting ways of answering the question, you may mention the sources themselves in the question or not. Either way goes, uh, for, fits perfectly. The document can also place the question in context. In this case, the document will guide the student by indicating the historical context that is referred to in the question. And in this case, the document is mentioned in the question. So the student would know which document to relate to or refer to. The third possibility for the role of the documents in that third criterion would be that it is part of the question. And then it would provide the students with information that is required for answering the question. And the document is mentioned again in the question for this as well. The fourth possible role of documents in this criterion would constitute the answer to the question. For example, having to place things, uh, relate things together, or make maybe cause and, and consequence together. In this case, the answer is there, and we cannot mention it, of course, in the question, but it enables the student to select as the answer to the question. So among the following, choose the ones that, and boom, boom, boom. So you can't put it in the question, but you're directing them to a specific uh, element of the document file, okay? So four different roles on this, it, for this one, because we have seven different uh, intellectual operations. And there they are. So the seven intellectual operations are establishing facts, situate in time and space, identify differences and similarities, determine causes and consequences, determine changes and continuities, relate facts, and establish causal link. Numbers four and seven sound and look quite similar, but bear with me and I will uh, take you through the, the, the seven and show you the difference. You may already know it, of course, but if you don't, if the nuance is still a little blurry, we will, uh, we will definitely look at it a little bit later on. 
Notice that the establishing fact operation is linked to a little bubble that says that this intellectual operation is assessed in its capacity to support the other operation. Meaning that much as in other cases, we're not looking at identification of facts, historical facts, just for the sake of evaluating that, but rather as a support or a skill set that they use to be able to complete the other intellectual operation. So in situation in time and space, a student would have to use the historical facts, the knowledge that they've built over uh, the weeks or the years or the months prior and use them in support of what they want to answer. And then you can assess whether or not they are competent. So establishing facts in itself is not a, an evaluation, uh, a question in itself, but rather a way to support the rest of the operation. So it's extremely important it's not something that we set aside, but rather that we wish to use and see the student use throughout the rest of the operation. <coughs> Pardon. And in the, uh, in the presentation of all of these intellectual operations, we have selected and the ministry had selected specific ones to uh, show the rubric and how to evaluate them. But please know that all the other albeit not done one at a time, one one on one, they are all found from, uh, in the same document. And this document is referred to in our reference page. So without too much delay, we will look at the intellectual operations themselves. So as I just said, in the establishing historical facts, the student must or the adult must identify relevant and accurate facts and not that it's evaluated in itself, but rather use it as references or uh, essential parts of the demonstration of the competency. So the more historical, historical facts, knowledge, and so on, the more we have in our backpack, in our toolkit, the better we can, uh, we can go through the rest of the operation. So very important, although not evaluated the same way. The second uh, intellectual operation is situate in time and space. As I was saying earlier, you will have a selection of ways to evaluate this particular operation. And the one that you see in purple is the one that is referred to the question and the one that is uh, identified to the particular rubric at the bottom. Please excuse the little blurriness did our very, very best to, um, to copy and paste this in the best possible um, fashion. If, I, if something is really not uh, clear or much, much too blurry, I did, uh, I did redo the, the templates just to make sure everything was clear. So in this case, the adult must order facts chronologically, taking into account reference points. The question that goes with this particular task is documents one to four present events related to the polit political status of Quebec from 1982 onward. The question is to place them in order. So as you can see, the historical facts are there. We need them. Huh? They are part of what we need to assess this. But the actual gesture or the action is to put them in order. One is done for them. And the other three must be placed in the chronological, chronological order that is, uh, that is prescribed. The student gets full marks for situating all the facts in time. And unfortunately, in this case, no marks if all three are not identified correctly. So you have the task, the question, and the rubric on the same page. If you're looking for the questions for the other tasks, you can find them in the document that I referred to earlier. If we look at identification of differences and similarities, again, same type of process, we have five possible tasks. Each of them are worth a number of points. In this case, we use the four bullets. The adult must indicate the specific point on which two actors or two historians agree or in other words, convergence for two points. 
The question that goes with it, document one presents the views of two actors on a political issue in Quebec. What specific point do they agree upon? If they can correctly identify, they get two marks. To a certain extent, this is your professional judgment right there. They can get one out of two. And of course, if it's incorrect or simply not, uh, not there, then the student obviously cannot get graded points on that. And as you can see, depending on the difficulty level of each task, you have a number of points that is allotted and that is different. The, follow, the rubrics that go with that are all in the document. Fourth one, determining causes and consequences. Two slides ago, three slides ago, we talked about the fact that four and seven may be a little similar, okay? Well, determining causes and consequences, we're really looking at two, two things, one cause, one consequence, and how they relate together. In the, uh, in the seventh intellectual operation, we will deal with a different set of uh, events. So in this case, we have two types of questions or two types of tasks. We chose the first one to illustrate. So in this case, the adult must indicate a fact that explained a historical reality. So there can be context, interests, objectives, and so on. So if the student can use the fact that explains the reality, they are making the link or determining the cause and the consequence, and they can get two points out of this. So the question based on document one, identify one cause of the rivalry between New France and the British colonies beginning in the 17th century. Again, there is your professional judgment that comes into play if the uh, factor is determined or explained to some extent. Identifying changes and continuities. There are three possible tasks. Again, different a level of difficulty with a different uh, point allotment or marks allotment. In this case, the adult must identify a fact that shows a historical phenomenon has undergone change. So we're looking for change, not continuity. And the question is, document one presents a change that occurs in the political structure following the constitutional act. What is this change? Well uh, determined or well identified two marks, to some extent one, not at all or incorrectly zero. So it's pretty straightforward in terms of the rubrics in this case. Second to last is establishing connections between facts. In this case, there's only one task that is identified as uh, establishing connections between facts. The student must associate facts with manifestations. Again, the word manifestation, I think I remember somebody pointing this out before as manifestation and, and you know, in French and in English may have a different, uh, a different uh, meaning, but manifestation in, for example, the, uh, the competency uh, diagrams that we saw earlier were taken from the ministry uh, the ministry translated documents. So again, we're taking the exact same uh, wording. So manifestations of these facts are descriptions that are related to them. Facts may vary, of course. So here we're looking at, for the example, there are four documents. They present the position of various social groups during the political crisis in Lower Canada in the 1830s. You need to enter in the appropriate space, the number of the document corresponding to the position of each group. So in this case, if the student establishes connections between all the facts, gets all four of them correct, they get their full marks. If they establish connections between two or three of the four, they get to, uh, one mark. And if they establish connections between one or zero, obviously, then that, uh, that gives them Unfortunately, zero marks. Last but not least, intellectual operation number seven, establishing causal connection. The way that, uh, the easiest way that I can, you know, illustrate for myself the cause, the causal connections is like a domino effect or a chain reaction in that it's not about A 
uh, an event that causes a reaction, but rather the cause is then moved on to another uh, aspect and another aspect. So there are more than just one cause, one consequence in this case. So there is only one way to present this and the, the one task that, that goes with establishing causal connections. It is the adult must express a logical connection between facts. So we have then, of course, three or more. In this case, three of them, which is ample if you look at the question. And what's interesting is that the question that was put in the document that we, uh, that we used was quite recent. So it's interesting to see also that we're not just referring to, uh, to you know, early or, uh, earlier uh, time periods, but really that we can go all the way up to our time and for real, not just all the way to the Second World War, for example. So this is quite recent. And the question has to do with uh, the government response to the accusations uh, with regard to the, the lumber industry. So if I read from the actual question, referring to the document below, you will explain how the US government's response to accusation by the American softwood lumber industry in the early, year, early 21st century led to actions by the Canadian government. So the question then will be, it's gonna be important to provide details on the elements below, so they are listed, and then establish connections between them. And that's where the causal connections come into play and not just cause and effect or cause and consequence. So three elements, the accusation against Canada by the American softwood lumber industry, the US government's response and an action taken by the government, the Canadian government following that response. If all is well and the student provides details on the three elements and correctly establishes two causal connections, they get full marks, three of them. If they correctly establish one causal connection, then they get two. If they do not correctly establish causal connections, they can get one mark because they at least provided details on the three elements. And we can then move downward to the box where it says that they uh, provide details on two elements and then below one element or does not prov uh, pro provide any, the, any of them. This is here, this is where your, um, your professional judgment is really called upon in the sense that the marking guide that comes with a ministry exam or an exam that is provided will give you some you know, paths or, or avenues where the proper and the right answers are supposed to be. But in this case, if you can see that the connections are established and they are logical and the student's answer reflect the meaning of what is expected in the marking guide, then of course you can accept uh, an equivalent wording in this case. Any questions on the seven intellectual operations? Well, you had a comment from Emily, she was saying, and I think it's very relevant. It's super mm -hmm. important to practice using linking words for these answers with the students. Absolutely important, yes. Very, very good point. Thank you, Emily. To show the causal connections is very important, absolutely. Any other question or comment? All right, thank you very much. Now, <clears throat> on the point of proficient knowledge, again, we're coming back to this knowledge, historical facts, and and what we have acquired, what we've built as a, a, a skill set of what we know about history, you will notice because we've repeatedly said so, but there are no tasks that are related to the proficiency criterion. Okay, so in the end of course evaluation, there will not be questions regarding the historical facts or the knowledge or the proficiency in that knowledge, but rather because that would be sorry, declarative knowledge. And that's not what we want to evaluate. We want to see how students build in what they know so they can make sense of what they present to us as uh, hopefully their competent answer. So the adult cannot apply his or her skill or components of skills without calling, on that, calling upon that knowledge. It's important to go back and use the knowledge to make as much sense as possible. So students are, do, are encouraged to, uh, to get as much 
uh, knowledge as they can, get informed, make sure that they follow what's going on, that they read on, on different things or get informed of what's going on around them politically or economically. Uh, but, and it doesn't really, it's not that we want them to be extraordinarily uh, proficient with knowledge because we all know that there are uh, difficulty uh, levels to this, but to encourage them to at least get that uh, information and get increase that 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 skill set or that toolbox is always something that uh, is good for them because whether we deal with any of the three criteria, each of them allow and require that we evaluate the ability to mobilize the knowledge and use it in any of the three of the two competencies and the three criteria criteria I'm sorry criteria wow it's been a long day. Are we all good here? Perfect. I took the liberty of putting a little excerpt from the framework for the evaluation of learning, just so that you could have a little bit more reading as if we didn't give you any. And there, that was the question period for the particular section, the evaluation section, and of course, not in anything ministry related, but rather on what we presented. Good. Three, two, one. All right. You're supposed now, to get to 30. The rules uh -huh. get to 30 seconds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Sorry. this Thank next you. part is what we are giving you as a little bit of a treat or something to leave with. And it's called La Phrase Histoire. Now, neither I nor Vanessa came up with this, but this is something that comes from the great minds of two pedagogical consultants from La Commission Scolaire des Découvreurs. And they came up with a tool that would be um, a way for students to make sense and make sure that there's a logical analysis of what they want to, uh, what they want to answer. So it's a way to build their, uh, build their, uh, their sentence so that it makes sense and it is a good, uh, a good analysis or it shows good analysis of and critical skills. So I'm going to go over the approach that they took and I wanna do them justice by really going uh, over what has been provided for this because this is uh, not ours, so we can't just skip any of that or explain it in other words. I want to do them justice. So the study of the past is not carried out in a vacuum, of course. Critical analysis of sources is essential for characterization and interpretation. And of course, we recognize C1 and C2 right there. The history classroom is rich and stimulating when it provides adult learners with the opportunity to discover evidence of the words, actions, objects, techniques, and everyday lives of historical actors. Sources can be of various types, we know that. Written documents, uh, images, audiovisual, artifacts, timelines, and so on. So in order to analyze their documentary record in history, so the document files, for example, the adult needs to employ strategies. La phrase histoire, at first glance, is just a sentence, right? Syntax, subject, verb, complement, or subject, verb, object. And it seems to be constructed upon just common syntax, but there's something behind it. There's an intention behind it. By formulating the statement this way, it makes for a coherent statement. So the basic sentence is composed of a subject, action, verb, and object but they want to create meaning by making the connections that Emily was also referring to by making sure that the transition words are you know, showing that they understand the cause and so on. So we wish here, we not being myself, but we wish to create meaning by connecting elements together and uh, those, dot, those being identified throughout the analysis. So they built a, uh, a template, they built a procedure template, I went and, because I couldn't just copy and paste it, so I had to redesign, but this is exactly the content of 
la phrase histoire, the template that they provided. So um, you have five elements in this particular phrase histoire. You have the source, the intention, the subject, the time, and the location. And in between each, transitioning terms, expressions that help create that uh, logical analysis that we're looking for. The source can be a historian, a witness, an actor, a document, a government, a community, a population. So any source, which would be the one that is um, giving the information, if you will. In French, they call it l'enonciata, okay? The one that's creating the message or sending the message. The next one is the intention. And the intention is formulated with the help of, war, of verbs. So you have related, said, did, told, you can have describe, you could have report in there. So the intention is uh, illustrated with the use of a verb. Then you have the subject itself, an event, conjuncture, a group, an actor, a problem, a law, a conflict even. And then afterwards, the time and the location. And the time can be very broad, an era, a period, can also be more uh, smaller, if you will, in, in time frame, like a date. It could even be a specific moment. And the location can also be very, very broad or very precise. So you have the five elements that make up la phrase histoire. We translated or we used the translation of what they had uh, placed in their presentation, which is a text that was taken from La Nouvelle France, Les Français en Amérique du Nord, which is, uh, which is a reference book. And the text is translated this way, from 1700 to 1755, the population of New France increased from about 14,000 to nearly 55,000, sorry, thanks to a high birth rate. And then they go on explaining what the, you know, who was immigrating and so on and so forth. And then Jacques Mathieu, historian, the proper citing of the source, all is there. Now this would constitute in itself without the colors, of course, in a document five. What do we do with that? Then we encourage students to actually go and identify. Oh, sorry, I forgot one. Sorry. Yes, it is. The excerpt is a description. Therefore, the intention is to describe. I forgot. I'm sorry. I hope you, 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 uh, you I, I hope you take my apology for this. And then you are, you will, uh, sorry, you will encourage your student to find the information in there that fits in each of the boxes. So the source, who said or who reported, then the intention, then the subject, the time, and the location. All of which, once it is done and gone over and made sure that they're ready and they have what they want, will be placed in the template. So they will place their source, their intention, the subject, the time, and the location that they have identified from the uh, document file. And a sample answer for this would be, it is Jacques Mathieu, a historian who described the population growth in New France during the first half of the 18th century. This sample answer, this phrase histoire, contains the essential elements that were taken from the source, from the document file, and constitute a clear, logical answer to the question that would be posed going with that. Now, of course, for grammatical reasons, there may be uh, situations where the syntax will call for time and location to be interchanged, but this would not make any difference unless it changed the sentence to a point where it, it is no longer logical, of course, and that uh, everybody knows uh, how to address this and their professional judgment, of course, uh, will be used. So this is what the tool, uh, the tool that was presented to us, and that is readily available. You can type in la phrase histoire. You have documents, you have even videos on how to use it. Um, and I'm sure uh, the two, uh, the two PCs that did it would be explaining it way better than I would. Uh, but 
essentially that's what the Hazistwa is doing and that's what it is uh, used for. It's a tool. We want to make sure to, to leave you with it because it's always nice to take something away from a presentation. So, so as long as the one that we present to you this afternoon. Can I add something to the other Yes, one? you can, absolutely. Thank you. So I was gonna say like, I was thinking of a like, very weak reader because I'm very into like reading strategies. And for me, this is also a reading strategy. Let's say that we have very weak readers. Like I, I was thinking about Mr. Gray, you know, uh, students who was talking about them earlier and say they have a hard time putting, a hard time okay. putting this into text, but it might be, they might have other difficulties like in reading. And this could just be to analyze of a document file and then they could answer the questions it could be like a, a first step before they yes. go on and work with the document file especially mm -hmm. in the classroom maybe not in the evaluation room but they could do this in the classroom to get more used to uh, analyzing document files so that, that that's actually something that i like because it's very flexible La phrase for. flexible and effective absolutely i agree and the other day vanessa and i were looking into we kind of stumbled upon a possible extension that we could possibly uh create or or uh suggest to complete this uh phrase histoire and maybe give a little bit more of the why for example and uh the how it came to be or maybe pushing a little bit further in explaining uh, how how things happen, but this is definitely a very good strategy to make sure that everything is in the answer that we're providing, that nothing is left out, and that if they can't fill in all the boxes, they can go back to their document file and look for the information that's missing. They may there may be nothing about you know, there may be no location, for example in which case it could be left uh, left empty and then finished right there. But definitely there will be a source and intention and a subject, that's absolutely for sure. The same way that a full sentence would have a subject, a verb and an object, for example. So they're basing this, this uh, reasoning on a simple sentence, but they're pushing it much further in, uh, in presenting the sense that they can make with the help of such a strategy. I'm going to let Vanessa conclude with a visual aid that to me is really like it's way too much information. <laughs> so I'm letting you describe it because yeah. you're better at it than I am. So, but I actually love graphs. So, and for me, it was very clear that this one, this graph represents all of the elements shown previously in the presentation regarding the program of study and the evaluation and how they are all linked together, how they work together as a system. Uh, and if a students would be able to do all of these actions and put all of these elements into inter interaction, they will actually become more competent. So we'll go from one at a time, because I know there's a lot of information. It's actually Julie that taught me how to show you to you guys. So she was like, go color by color, because you know me, my <laughs> my eyes needs to go somewhere. So I'm like, OK. This is because I'm illiterate in those types of, that's why I needed you to take me step by step, color by color. It's perfect. I'm going to use this, and uh, you, you can uh, say in the feedback form, does it work for you guys too or not? So. We have the two main competencies like characterize and interpret that are at the top written in white over the little black you know, squares. And as you can see with the arrows, they communicate to each other. Like we've said that before, characterizing helps interpreting. And once you've interpreted, then you can become better at characterizing. So you understand all of the social reality and phenomenon that in the time periods way better. And you see how these two interact together. So your competency just grows and it flows from one to the other. So that was the, the, the big arrows and the different arrows. So in the middle of the black circle, you actually have all of the key features that we presented. Like when I presented the two diagrams, I was saying for each uh, competency, you have three key features. So those are in there in the black circle. And then at the top of it, of it all, you have the three aims of the program. And there's like kind of a, for me, it's like a, it says it all, you want to develop this circle thinking into your students. So that's another way to put it. And in order to do so, you need to mobilize 
everything that's down there. So in red, in the like middle arrow, you actually have the three criteria that Julie presented in the evaluation section. And if you look at appropriate use of knowledge that's very apparent in the middle, just below in red, what you have are the intellectual operations. So you have all of them. And then everywhere in green at the bottom, I, I, it's supposed to be green at the bottom, but it's not like super clear on screen, but it's supposed to be green. You have the knowledge, yeah. the social phenomenon linked to interpret, and then you have the time period linked to characterize. So everything that we said basically is there. And for me, like I, I didn't create it, but for me, the intention of this graph was probably <laughs> because I don't want to put words into the creator you know, mouths, but for me, it's probably to, to show that everything is working together as a system. And this could represent a very good uh, example of this, all, all of the elements uh, that we need to use in order to get our students to be competent into the history classroom. So I, I actually love a graph. So I, I hope you like it too. Once you can print it, like when you, you're going to receive the presentation, you're going to be able to see all of the details and the, the great information that's over there. But it, it pre, it pre, it's a good summary of what we've said through the whole presentation, I think. A visual summary is, is good for some and other, others need words. Uh, and this is how uh, the ministry uh, team was able to cater to uh, as many of the needs out there as possible. And we thank them for that because it made our job much, much easier. Uh, just before we go, I just wanna make sure that everybody gets uh, to take a look at, of course, there's a reference page, but also our contact information. And you will receive in the chat uh, a, a feedback form link uh, but tomorrow morning, we will also send it to your email addresses. So in case some of you had to leave, uh, it will be sent. And also, uh, if you have people that came in and had to leave, you can pass uh, this, uh, this along to them. We do appreciate your feedback. We want your feedback. It's important that we get it because January 12th, we're preparing for the other training session. This time we were, going, we're going to be dealing with financial education. And uh, so we're reminding you, if you know of anyone that would like to participate, they can still re register. And uh, the registration form is online, of course. We can also send it along if needed. So that's it for us. If there's anything else on your end, you can stay behind and uh, have a little chat with us. Otherwise, you're free to go. Get back to us in January and we will see you again at the financial education workshop.